Hello everybody, welcome to the Wonky Angle, where I talk about electronic music, both new and old. And it's time for another worst to best ranking. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I'm ready to finish off this series once and for all and not have to talk about these guys again for a while. At least until their supposed two new albums they've hinted at come out, but whatever, I guess we'll see how that goes. Please, for the love of God, let those albums be a normal length. I really don't want to review another 8-plus hours of material from these guys. But whatever, we're ranking all 13 Outagur Studio albums. No EPs, whether they're long enough to be albums or not. Just the main albums that I did proper reviews on. For the sake of keeping this simpler for myself. Now, this series wasn't actually nearly as big a pain to get through as I might have thought it would be. Going through all these guys' albums has actually been pretty fun. Finally putting my thoughts on all these projects into words has really helped almost all of them grow on me, or at the very least helped me to understand the appeal of projects that I might not have understood before. It was quite an enlightening experience, and every single one of their albums is definitely at least interesting and gives me plenty to say. Personal enjoyment-wise, my thoughts haven't shifted around much, but I'm definitely glad I went through everything in so much detail. I definitely have more of an appreciation for their stuff now than I did before this series, and I'm less completely sick of them than I was of Biosphere at the end of my series on him. It's been fun. But now it's finally time to bring this series to an end and move on to the next one. So, may as well get through the usual disclaimers. This is just my opinion and you can feel free to disagree with it, I'm just ranking it based on personal enjoyment and how willing I'd be to come back to any given project. And obviously everyone's ranking is going to be different, especially with these guys in particular. Every single one of their projects has the potential to be someone's number one pick. Or for that matter, all of them have the potential to be someone's least favorite as well. Lots of people have had lots of different tastes in these guys' music given how diverse their catalog is. I could even disagree with this ranking myself later on, though admittedly in this case I kind of doubt it, it didn't really change that much while I was doing this series. Chances are if you've already watched all the reviews and or have been following me for long enough you won't really run into many surprises and can probably guess where my opinions would lie. I do still think a video like this can add to the discussion in some way, nice to break it down in this format as well. But yeah, may as well get into it. This is... Outaker, worst to best. And number 13, it's the NTS sessions, one through four. So, um, shockingly enough, the eight hour album is the project of theirs I least want to come back to again. Well, more accurately, the project I least want to sit through in its entirety be it all in one go or broken up into its four pieces over multiple days. There's just not enough here for me to justify being so actively inconvenient to digest. This whole project is just so freaking long-winded. It, it feels like the kind of project that aims to physically alter your perception of time. On this album scale, an eight-minute track could feel like an interlude. It's absolutely ridiculous. Now, are there creative ideas here and tracks here and there that do still work for me? Yeah, absolutely. I did put together a little cut-down version of NTS on my iPod that only includes 11 of my favorite tracks from the project, these in particular, and that adds up to an experience that runs on for a good two and a half hours. And there is still more stuff from here that I enjoy that that track listing leaves out for the sake of brevity. <laughs> and I also will admit, as crushingly long as NTS is without editing, it does still feel like an album and a complete piece. Each of the four sessions feel like they go through an arc in their own right, but also forming one mega arc that culminates quite dramatically at the end of NTS 4. Lots of people have told me about how they're able to digest the whole thing in one go and even do so on a regular basis, many quite fervently holding it up as Outiker's strongest project overall. And while the idea of getting to that point myself seems crazy, I can also understand where those people are coming from. I could see some of these ideas resonating more with other people who didn't get sick of them. And it's not like they're trying to shove eight hours of the same crap over and over down your throat. I get it. But still, personally, I just can't with this one. Two, three hours of this thing was pretty good, but that leaves like five hours of stuff that didn't really interest me. And you know, I have been the kind of person who has complained about certain projects of their being too out there and experimental and not musical enough for me to get into. 
This isn't actually a gripe with me on NTS. If anything, I think NTS isn't out there enough. I mean, spoilers, I don't have this problem with LSEC, and that project gets pretty damn experimental or sometimes even samier than NTS. I'll get more into that one later. But so much of this material feels like stuff they've already done on other projects just longer. For example, there's quite a few throwbacks to their sound of the early 90s, like 4 of 7 and E0 and others. And they're welcome, but pale in comparison to their stuff actually from that era. And that's not counting all the stuff that feels like a rehash of LSEC, like Turbo Epic Casual Stipple Idol, which I liked at first, but now I basically see as Onium with more headaches. Or tracks that feel like Watered Down, Comfield, and Exi. Even that little collection of my favorite tracks doesn't translate to a properly great album in my eyes. Well, at least a good one, and still keeping a semi-satisfying arc intact, it, it still kind of feels like a B-Sides album made out of stuff that wouldn't fit on LSEC. That's the thing, too much of NTS is nothing more than a dull chore to me, with so many ideas that maybe could have been compelling at first but never go anywhere, way overstay their welcome and get really stale. I mean, that there's as much good material from here that I still think is worth keeping is commendable in its own right, and obviously great for you if you are able to get into it so much more easily like people have talked about. I want to make it clear, as much as I rag on this project and consistently use it as a punchline, I do not hate it. Even its absolute worst moments I think are just meh. And as an unedited whole, I don't even dislike it, I just think it's okay. But I'm never gonna feel like committing 8 freaking hours to a project that overall is only okay for me. Especially for all the multiple repeat lessons that Outdoor albums always seem to need to work best. It's got its moments for sure, it's probably at least worth giving a shot if you're a fan of these guys and you may find completely different standouts from my own picks, but in my eyes, it's far from their best work and only serves to endlessly frustrate me. And number 12, I have Draft 7.30. Well, at least unlike NTS, Draft doesn't completely kill Outdoor's aesthetic for me and make me desperately want to listen to something that sounds absolutely nothing like them. Given the choice between which project to sit through again, I would rather listen to Draft than have to go through NTS again for reasons I should think are pretty obvious. But I still really don't care for Draft much, and it's unlikely I ever will. It's got two tracks I really like, Surapir and Vproc. And if I want to be generous, Run From Pulse is nice too, but eh, that's about it. The rest of this album just does nothing for me. It's always been a big stumbling block with me and Outgur. Like, whenever in the past I've talked about their stuff being too experimental or doing nothing for me emotionally or not having melodies or whatever other applicable snide comments, Draft was always the album I had in mind when I said stuff like that. Now, at the very least, thanks to this series, I feel like I at least get this album now. Before, I felt like I was listening to a completely different album from everyone else and got really confused about it. But thankfully, I no longer feel that way. Still don't get how some review outlets found this comparable to Try Repeat in any way, but it really doesn't matter anymore. This project does certainly get points for uniqueness, its heavily detailed mixes being applied to some very liquid and free-flowing compositions isn't anything like any other project I know, and it does all seem to form together to make a cohesive sense of space, but it's just such a gray and unpleasant album for me. All these tracks feel like I'm not standing on solid ground and can induce motion sickness. It's just not fun to listen to. I do have a ton of respect for how well produced it is and how much work and effort clearly went into every second of the project. I understand how it was able to resonate so strongly with other people, but I can't really jump on the bandwagon myself. I am holding on to Sir Appear and Vproc. I put them into a custom album of my favorite random tracks from EPs, which kind of looks like this now. But now that this series is over, I'll be quite happy to put the rest of this project behind me. Cool album, highly creative stuff, really not my thing. And number 11, I have Chiastic Slide. Ah, Chiastic Slide. This album actually has grown on me a fair bit, admittedly. Its standouts like Saipater, Keechley, New Wayne, and Calbrook continue to hold up, but the low points like Tiwi and Recurry and Hub continue to drag for me and have only gotten more tedious. And even as a whole, while the project may feel warmer and more welcoming than Draft, that's 
really not saying much. It's still very cold and detached and feels like everything is made out of old, out-of-date machinery and takes place in some town of, in Alaska where there's a population of like 50 and 49 of them are dicks to you. The whole thing is either a giant mixed bag or just total background music that doesn't leave any strong impression on me, never really anything in between. I do at least feel like this project almost has a vibe to it that I'd want to return to though, which is why on my iPod I replace four of my least favorite tracks with some tracks from Envane and Keechley Sweet. So now it looks like this. Kind of has a quaintness to it I like and the whole thing is a marginally more pleasant experience while still delivering the same general vibe. But the original album... eh. I get why people love it and consider it one of the best. It certainly is the point at which Outica really started to separate themselves from the 90s-isms of their first three albums and entered into the much more unique path they ended up in later on. Certainly an interesting transitional moment for them. But for me, it's just really inconsistent and not one of their more interesting projects overall. And number 10, I have Oversteps. I will have to give credit to Oversteps for being another one of the projects that first helped me get into Outica in the first place. Certainly the much more melodic approach to this album made it stick out like a sore thumb in the catalog, and its heavily haunting and intense atmosphere is really well done across the board. I was absolutely glad that they made an album like this to finally tone things down a bit. But still, even on my earliest listens of the album, I would have had a really hard time picking out favorites or track that stuck out to me. It's the single samiest project I've heard from these guys, and while at least as of late I have been able to pick it apart and have definite favorites and least favorites, my least favorites already sound like other tracks on here. They feel like redundant filler. And that in itself has made it much harder to fully sign off on it. I'm not used to having that kind of concrete issue with an Outdoor album's construction. Usually it's just not my thing and doesn't go further than that. But I will say that, like with Chiastic Slide, I did put together an alternate track listing for this one that combines my favorite tracks with some highlights from their Move of 10 EP. So it looks like this now. <laughs> and even before I edited it down, there were still undoubtedly more good moments than bad moments. It hasn't held up as well in their overall catalog after closer examination, but I am certainly glad it exists. And number nine, I have Confield. Confield has always been an album that I respect more than I outright enjoy. Every track may be very well constructed, as is the album as a whole, but most of it just feels like it's flying over my head and I don't really know what to make of it. Not to mention, as the album goes on, it kind of slowly starts to lose me. The first third is great, the second third is good, and the last third is... eh, not my thing. The album could always feel like a bit much, to say the least. Another one of those moments in their catalog where it felt like their experimentalism was going too far for me to connect with. And that still mostly holds true, but this still gets ranked above Oversteps because unlike that project, I would not feel right messing with this project's track listing in any way. I don't have an alternate track listing for this or any of the albums ranked higher. As much as my enjoyment of Confield tends to fluctuate, it feels like the best possible version of itself. There, like, there's nothing I can really do to improve upon it without ruining the experience. Like I said, I have a ton of respect for the way it comes together as a whole. The whole thing feels like the pinnacle of Outdoor's catalog when it comes to sheer attention to detail and density from a track-by-track -track basis. For example, even if I don't particularly enjoy the completely insane ending that is Lentic Catacresis, it still feels like the logical endpoint for an album like this and is the best way you could have ended it. On some level, you kind of have to appreciate its craft whether you like it or not, and this is true basically across the board here. Also, while this project has fewer standouts for me than Oversteps, they're much bigger standouts for me. Pen Experts is one of the biggest and most hard-hitting bangers they have ever done, and Seaver and I obviously highlight it as one of my top three favorite tracks of theirs overall. So, I don't know. While I don't really see myself listening to this project much in the future now that the series is done, I still have the whole thing on my iPod. I'm not usually in the mood for it, but I certainly have been in the mood for it before, and I imagine there will be a time I'll be in the mood for it in the future. It's a good project. Has its place for me. And number eight, I have Amber.
Given how Amber was the first project I ever heard from these guys and my introduction to them in the first place, this may seem like a pretty low ranking, and yeah, I'm not really sure why this project never really did as much for me, especially given my thoughts on their other stuff from this era. Now, don't get me wrong, I still think it's a really good project. It's just not one of their most consistent ones from, like, a personal enjoyment level. There's tracks that do way more for me than others. Silverside still rises way above the rest of them for me, and I still really like Further, Yulquen, Montreal, Slip, and Tier Tier. But there's also moments like Piezo and Nil that, while I don't mind or skip, also never stuck out to me quite as much. Again, it's not like oversteps where these tracks feel outright redundant or rehashing each other. They just, I don't know, didn't really stick out to me. It also kind of bugs me because it feels like my favorites were most people's least favorites and vice versa. It feels like the whole comment section of that review was talking about how Nil was the best track on the album by a long shot and nah, uh, that one's still probably my least favorite. It's fine, but it is just kind of plain in comparison with other tracks on here to me. And while I'm on that topic, whatever I say about this one, it's worth noting that I am definitely going against the grain by saying Amber's not in the top half of my ranking of these guys. It's one of their most popular picks for Best Outdoor Project overall, even among the people who are more drawn to their later stuff over the 90s classics. I certainly think it's one of their most cohesive, all, the, all of these tracks really working together towards the greater whole and forming that kind of alien atmosphere despite being so much more accessible than their stuff afterwards. Someone described it as a journey to a land not found on any map, which is pretty accurate. I guess at the end of the day, I think it's been topped. There's not much I can really point to that I think is wrong with it, besides there's other albums I've heard similar to it, either by Outdoor themselves or by other people in the same genre. Whatever. I'm still hanging on to the whole thing and see myself coming back to it in the future. I just think there are seven other albums of theirs I would rank higher. At number seven, I have LP5. This project has easily been the biggest grower in their catalog for me. Not to say some of my issues don't still stand, most notably I think the mixing on these tracks is really tin and thinny and makes it feel less satisfying or even grating with enough repeat listens. That's still this album's Achilles heel for me. And I did say in my review that this was the kind of project that for a long time left so little impression on me that even directly after listening to it I would forget its entire musical contents and not be able to remember what any track besides Acro Year 2 sounded like. I might have inadvertently implied I didn't like the album because its melodies weren't catchy enough, and that is not what I meant to say. Catchiness is a nice bonus, but not a make or break thing, especially when it comes to an album like this. But it's also a case where making the review actually kind of helped resolve this issue for me as well. Having to write down descriptions for each individual track helps me remember what they sound like and have a much clearer map in my mind for how the album plays out. It's still kind of ephemeral, but not to the same extent as it was before I did the review. The project still has lots of their best tracks, Full 4 Rap 5, Under BOAC, Drain 2, I or two mention that. There's tons of creative ideas with every track feeling like it has a unique identity but still fitting together in a satisfying arc and experience. Even the lower points like 777, Vosin, or Cork, or the interludes like Melv and Caliper Remote. Every track feels like it adds something as substance, is perfectly done from a pacing standpoint, and compositionally feels like the payoff to what Chiastic Slide was still transitioning into. It's much more consistent to me than Amber. Though Amber does definitely sound better, feel more cohesive, and obviously has stronger nostalgia, it was pretty close with these two. They're the most likely to switch spots. I still don't think I would call LP5 one of my favorite albums of all time, or even one of my biggest favorites from them overall. It's, it's right in the middle of the ranking, obviously, but it's undoubtedly the one that most benefited from my reviewing it. I may not remember much of it as well as I'd like to, but I do at least know, well, I'll be getting some great stuff whenever I do put it on. And number six, I have Elsick 1 through 5. <laughs> Oh god, Elsek. I almost feel obligated to say more about this one than the other since my review was so long ago. I had a different mindset from the way I feel on these guys now and was... That video was almost kind of written more like a first reaction. I don't hate that video, it's perfectly true to how I felt at the time, and I still stand by the final rating I gave it, but my opinions evolved on it since. So yes, I still think this four-hour project is great. 
And every listen I've given it has ended up with it getting better and feel like that length is more and more justified. It has been a weird one to parse since I enjoy it on a totally different level from any of their other projects. But I think Oliver from Deep Cuts put it best when he compared a project like this more to ambient music. It may have the same kinds of beats and attention to detail that previous projects have, but its scale means the minor details don't really matter anymore. It's much more about creating a sense of place and a vibe and atmosphere to get yourself immersed in, and I think it works really well in that regard. Now, this means I also kinda now have to directly compare it to NTS and reckon with how this holds up so much better than that, despite having a, such a similar appeal and approach. I mean, yes, four hours may not be nearly as much of a ridiculous commitment as eight hours, but it's still a pretty ridiculous commitment. It still looks more like a box set than a studio album just looking over its track listing. Yes, it's more approachable than NTS, but what isn't? <laughs> But I don't know, Elsec feels much more like a real album to me. For one thing, Elsec feels like it has more of an original identity and a feel of its own that you can't get elsewhere, while NTS feels like a mishmash of every previous era of their career. It is quite possibly Outicar at their most intense and freakiest, but still, I feel like they were using the hugeness of the album to their advantage. The music itself is as cosmic and expansive as the scale is. It also feels much more unified and cohesive than NTS. I wouldn't call it samey, there's still plenty of sonic variety as a project of this length absolutely needs to have, but it all still feels like it belongs together in the same universe. It has a much better flow. My opinions on the tracks themselves have kind of shifted as well over the years. Parts I didn't enjoy before have slowly evolved to become favorites. I now enjoy the first volume way more than I used to. Sure, Feed 1 isn't the most eventful of openers and still feels more like advice to get you used to the album scale. Everything else there is really solid. C16 Deep Tread, 13X Zero Step, and Pendulo HV Moda make for a particularly exciting and evocative stretch of the album that has plenty of great, freaky atmosphere, and Curve Keten is a nice way to ease up on the tension momentarily. The near half-hour journey of LEC6 Onset stuffed so much more impressive detail and cool progressions, and was way better than I remembered on my most recent listen. And T7B2 probably wouldn't be my least favorite moment anymore. It's still really out there, but it didn't really throw me off or push me away this time. Just kind of fit in the mix naturally. Now my least favorite is probably Pendulum Casual. That one's not very interesting in retrospect. And neither is previous highlight mesh scenario, though that one is much better. I go back and forth with that one, still really like that change up in the last 8 minutes. Also, Full Free Casual used to be an instant favorite with its much more pleasant melodic sections, but weirdly didn't feel quite as impactful this time. Maybe I'll come back around on it later, I don't know. But there are obviously tracks I liked back then and still like now. The muted ambient drone of Easter, the hip-hop-like beats of TBM2, the twisted ambient techno of Freelul, and the freaky but oversteps adjacent Onium and Spaces How V. The latter's a particularly big favorite. And of course, Leighton Call is probably forever going to be my favorite track in the bunch. But altogether, I think what speaks most to LSEC's quality is that despite its ridiculous length, I don't feel intimidated by it anymore. When I look up at this, I think, alright, this'll be fun, and the four hours go by quicker than I would expect. While NTS still looks like way too much of a commitment or even, like, hard work to get through. LSEC may have moments that aren't as strong, and obviously the length makes it the kind of thing I'm not always gonna have time for. As such, other albums of theirs that are a more normal length are going to get more precedence. But I'm still keeping the whole thing on my iPod without feeling the need to edit any of it down. I won't blame anyone who would be so intimidated at the, by the idea of having to set aside the time to go through this whole thing. But it starts strong, it ends strong, it feels like a complete and satisfying experience that I was almost never bored by, and that they were able to pull it off as well as they did and still get me to feel like I'd want to come back to it is a massive achievement. And number five, I have Untilted. Untilted slaps. Of the projects in their late 90s, early 2000s period of going all out technically complex, this has to be my favorite of those. It was much easier to get into given how unlike much of Confield and Draft, all the beats adhere to a more well-defined grid and pulse. Even if many sections went absolutely off the chain, they would do so in a way that I personally found much more exciting. Just lots of beats and sounds flying past you at high speed, and it's one hell of a ride. 
It's also one of their most interesting from a structural standpoint. The way each of these tracks evolves and changes over time in a prog rock sort of way is probably the album's main selling point for me. And it's also probably their tightest release to date given how there's only 8 tracks. They are pretty long tracks, but they certainly give you lots to keep you interested and the experience doesn't feel long at all. Now granted, it's not the most impressively produced project in their catalog, and not to mention it's so centered around the beats and doesn't really bother itself with the melodies as much. They're still there, but they're never the focus and are usually pretty thin. But I don't know, these issues didn't get as much in the way of being a fun experience as they did on other projects of theirs. I've seen keep people complain about it being one of their most difficult listens before, and I actually disagree in this case. I mean, okay, I didn't exactly love it on first listen either, and it is definitely one I need to be paying close attention to get the most out of it. But I did get into it a lot more quickly than anything else they were doing in this era. I think it's actually pretty accessible provided you're into more drum and bass type material from their cohorts like Aphex Twins Drugs or Square Pushers earlier stuff. Very much has the same kind of appeal as projects like those, albeit with the usual colder Raudiker flares. I don't know, it's not one I really see people talk about often, but maybe it should be getting more attention. It's a pretty great album if you ask me. And speaking of underrated projects... Whoops. And number four, I have Chorus Dis. Chorus Dis is a weird moment in these guys' catalog and a total shift in approach from what they were doing before. Rather than pack every track with as much detail as they possibly could, they were cutting bits out of weird electronic jam sessions and putting together a release made out of lots of really short tracks that tend not to really transition into each other or seem to coalesce together as a complete piece. But there was always something about this one that drew me into it, and not just because of that eye-catching bright blue album cover. It's no less weird than other projects of theirs, if anything in retrospect it might even be their weirdest, aided by the rapid tone shifts. But they still all feel like they're building to something, and belong in the same sonic environment, as if you're going through, like, every room in a giant submarine. The rapid tone shifts might have bothered me on some listens, but I could get used to it pretty quickly. There's a definite method to its madness, and an overarching atmosphere that actually made it easier to digest as a high schooler. You know, this kid with ADD whose mind was much more wired towards enjoying ambient music. I mean, my mind is still wired that way, but <laughs> it's probably because of this, my pro this project has always stuck with me so much more than it seems to for most people. Even despite not being much more melodic than their previous several projects up to that point, the focus on more ambient-leaning pieces helped to connect with me way more easily early on. And the fact that it was one of my first is also probably why it's up as high as it is. I've seen people describe this project as cute, and while I don't think I fully agree in that way, these tracks are all still pretty freaky and cold and metallic as always, but I guess if any project of theirs could be described in that way, it probably would be this one. <laughs> all that aside, I've still always enjoyed its unique candy box approach and oddly compelling moody atmosphere. It's always stuck out to me, and of course has had a longer time to connect with me than many of these other projects. I will get it if it's too incohesive and all over the place to work for other people, but it's always at least going to be a personal favorite of mine. And number three, I have Try Repeat A. Outdoor albums are almost never catchy, but that's not to say they don't have it in them to make stuff that is. And Try Repeat A is one of the biggest go to examples. It may be one of their most harsh-sounding and industrial-leaning albums, but not in such a way that took away from my enjoyment, obviously. They are able to work these metallic mixes into repetitive patterns that stick in the brain pretty easily. And while there are in fact present melodies and bass lines on pretty much all of these tracks, the thing that usually sticks in the head on any given track is the percussion patterns, which are all distinct and bang in their own way. Even some of the weirder grooves on that like stud are still pretty easily memorable. And even the tracks that aren't as catchy, like Rotar, are still pretty satisfying to listen to and fit into the mix quite cleanly. And people thought I hated that track because I didn't mark it as a huge favor, but there really aren't any tracks here that I don't like or feel don't serve a purpose. Another one of those projects where something similar sounding could theoretically be a turnoff for me, but its particular execution was done in such a way that it grew on me a lot more quickly than many other albums of theirs. Still pretty accessible stuff by their standards, and the kind of thing I could still wrap my head around even pretty early on. Not much else to say, it's a classic album, it's probably in the upper half of most people's rankings, and an easy contender for best album of theirs overall, and I pretty much agree with the hype. Whoopsh. 
And number two, I have XI. Another project you wouldn't necessarily think would be my thing given my usual tastes, but to me, XI is basically the culmination of all their weirdest experimentations in the 2000s and onwards. The production and sound design is absolutely stellar across the board, and there's so much diversity from track to track, while still all clearly fitting together in one cohesive piece. It may also be the point at which these guys decided that they don't need to fit albums in traditional lengths and go as long as they wanted. This album is two hours long, not a cakewalk. But in this case, it doesn't feel like they were specifically trying to stretch things out as on the two albums that came out after it. They just had a lot of material to give you. And they made sure to stop before it would get overwhelming. And it all kind of has a similar appeal to Untilted in that it's just a crazy, fast-paced ride that takes you through all sorts of different sounds, but times 20. The amount of different sounds and ideas is so much more grand and vast, the compositions are so much richer and more detailed, and the production is more dense and blunt and pumping and just generally much more satisfying. It's absolutely nuts, and there's not a single second of running time where I'm not engaged or kept on the edge of my seat. It's absolutely epic, and it shows this duo still ahead of the curve in delivering some of their best and most compelling material over two decades into their career. The only reason it's not number one is that it's still an album I kind of have to be in the right mood to get the most out of it. And if you hadn't already guessed what my number one pick is before even clicking on the video, whoopsh, at number one, I have Incunabula. I mean, I kind of already gave it away back when I reviewed it, but yeah, just like I said on my top 10 tracks list for these guys, I'm sure some people may think this is a kind of lame pick for the number one spot. It's nowhere near their most technically advanced project or their most creative. If anything, it's probably their least creative and the one that most adheres to trends of the time, just following the artificial intelligence sound that Warp Records was pushing so much at the time, was even a proper volume in said Warp Records series, and hasn't totally aged that well. That they moved on from here and put out stuff that was so much more impressive and ahead of the curve is only a good thing. But still, Incunabula holds up as basically the best album ever to play the artificial intelligence sound completely straight. It's a product of its time, yes, but the production is so perfectly balanced, the beats can both bang or just be laid back and chill, nearly every melodic line can get stuck in my head, it so perfectly demonstrates why the sound was so popular and why so many people were drawn to it and tried to replicate it around the time. Now, XI does in fact have the potential to be my number one pick depending on my mood, but Incunabula tops the list because it hits the same way for me every time no matter what my mood is. That's the most important element of it for me that raises it above all their other stuff. Outer Curve always made the kind of stuff that I need to be in the right mood to get into properly. I'm not the kind of guy who always has the patience for their brand of emotionally distant out there experimentalism. And this album is the exception to all that. It's just so much comfier and more welcoming than any of their other projects. It's the only album of theirs that I can listen to basically anytime. So. Yeah, there you have it. Incunabula, it's my favorite Outdoor album. And that's it. That's the end of the video. That's the end of the series. All right. But of course, this is just my opinion. You can feel free to disagree with it, but I'd like to hear your thoughts. So leave the comments in the comment thing down there. Shout out to my Patreon supporters. They're awesome people. You want to add yourself to that list or make me review something, a link to my Patreon is in the description. Max discography review is Patreon requested. Uh, I'm not, I'm not probably not going to be doing that much again. But uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. That's all for today. See you next time. Orker Tekker, AUA Teshraye, Oetker, AU Decker, Utishri, Mau Touch Arye, Boof Brown, Ow Teshre, Aw Tech Rur, Sudiker, Architecture, Arch Teacher, O Teacher, Ow Turkey, Or Dervs, Ow Tachra, I can't do a French accent, Uh, A Blind Glaze, Por Favor, Aho Taker, Outis Tekker, Lego Feet, U Toy Chu, O Teak Ray, Etiki, With Silence About You, A E Teaker, Or Tetra Wave,
<coughs> Ayo Tech Haro. Ayo O Tu Hakira. Or I Cal Cum. Auto Curry. Adolphus W. Green, 1844 to 1917, started as the principal of the Grotan School in 1864. By 1865, he became second assistant librarian at the New York Mercantile Library from 1867 to 1869. He was promoted to full librarian from 1869 to 1873. He worked for Evard Southmade and Choates, a law firm co founded by William M. Evarts, Charles Ferdinand Southmade, and Joseph Hodges Choate. He was admitted to the New York State Bar Association in 1873. Next discography review is Rum Pistol. Thank you for watching!